Well, I have a short message I'm going to bring. And um, I say short because that's my determination and I know I need to and I've already talked for a little while. But um, as I was preparing to speak, the thing that was so strong, the message that was so strong in my heart is a resting place. That God has a resting place for each of us. And we need to find the resting place. And I want to say that that resting place must be found in the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus Christ. Hear that, please. A resting place in the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and in the person of Jesus Christ. Sometimes our Christian faith can become very complex. If you're ever online and see some of the debates that go back and forth over different subjects, it just baffles your mind. And you can be talking to other believers and, and looking at all the different theological um, debates that have happened throughout church history and still continue on as you're trying to figure out some things yourself, or even as we do something like read the book of Romans, sometimes our faith can become, can look very, rather complex. But I want to say this, as believers in Christ, we need to be able to get down to the basic ABCs as individuals and find rest in the simplicity of the gospel. Yes, our faith is many faceted, and yes, there are complex things and things difficult to understand. There's profound mysteries to the Christian faith. Um, for example, Augustine, and whether the story was true or not, and I know I've shared this before, about, but the Augustine just struggling over the doctrine of the Trinity. In fact, I was just um, reading something by Carl Truman who said that Augustine's his discourse on the Trinity is probably the best that's ever been written on that subject in the history of the church. I almost could have bought a copy of it at Half Price Bookstore once and didn't. I went back for it and it was gone. <laughs> but anyways, um, but Augustine, uh, once again, the story goes, whether it's true or not, it might not be, but sees the child, you know, going to the, the, the big ocean and taking water and carrying it back in his little bucket and throwing it into a hole and kept going back and forth, back and forth. And finally, Augustine went over and interrupted him and said, what are you doing? And the kid said, well, I'm, I'm going to take that ocean and I'm going to one bucket full at a time and I'm going to put it in my hole. And Augustine said, you could never put that ocean in this little hole. And the remark of the child was, and neither could you ever comprehend the doctrine of the Trinity fully. Never, you can't get that into your head. <laughs> so I think that's a, an interesting illustration, perhaps isn't a true story, but it is a, an excellent illustration. And there's so much about God that we baffle our minds over. It's like, it's kind of like trying to get the ocean into that little hole and w w there's certain things we just can't figure out. But not only, not only that about our faith, but our lives as well. We go through storms, we go through difficult times. And I believe with all my heart that in the times of struggle and difficulty, perhaps in sickness and perplexity, that we need to learn how as believers to find rest, to somehow retreat a little bit, and find rest in the simplicity of the person and the work of Jesus Christ, his gospel, him, Jesus Christ himself. The first scripture I'd like to briefly look at, one that we're proud, I know, I'm pretty confident we're all familiar with, is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. A reminder of uh, something Jesus Christ himself has said here. Matthew 11:25 25 to 30. It says, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, 
that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. I like the, the way the King James reads, you've revealed them to babes. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. When he says the wise and the prudent or the wise and the understanding, he's, he's not saying there's anything wrong with having understanding and wisdom. He's talking about those who perhaps take, put a lot of confidence into their own, their own wisdom and understanding. Jesus then says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. It's one of the biggest arguments for the deity of Christ right there. Sovereign choice, sovereign prerogative to reveal the Father to any to whom he chooses anywhere they are at any time. That's something only God can do. And then Jesus says, come to me. He didn't hold up his hand and, says, and say that I can reveal the Father to you, but I might not. He immediately says, come to me. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Heavy laden or weary? Are you tired? Are you burdened? Are you weary? And just simply come to me and I will give you rest. I will, not might, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Jewish people at that time called the Torah a yoke. And learning all of the laws to obey and to follow, that following and obeying the Torah was a yoke and a burden. But Jesus said, my teachings, me, what I have, my yoke, is easy. It's sweet. And you'll find rest for your souls. So we can learn something just from this one passage. Are you burdened? Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you perplexed? Are you fed up? Are you confused? Come to Jesus Christ, to him. Don't worry about finding all the answers. Don't worry about the perplexities of theology or don't even worry about the perplexities of your own emotionality and your, the, the baggage you carry and the wounds you have and what all that means. Come to Christ. Come to Christ and just focus on him. An example of that is in, in something that I do often is a number of years ago, I was part of a Bible study at Elmbrook Church. It was a small group Bible study. And we were supposed to be praying, each, to take a few moments, each one of us to pray for the person on our right. And the person to my left was praying for me. And of course I was praying for that person, but this picture, a mental picture came to me of of that moment when I'm finally finished with my journey and I stand before Jesus Christ. And I'm going to paint that picture for you here, not literally, but <laughs> let me start it with a question though for you. Have you ever thought of that? What is that moment going to be like when my journey here is complete and I stand before Jesus Christ? What is that moment going to be like? Try to imagine that. I um, would ask you to try to imagine that for just a, at least a moment on an individual basis. One of the things that I, I, I think it, I can't remember wh which speaker said it now, but one of the speakers was talking about our salvation and our, 
our union with Jesus Christ, our relationship with him. And he said, yes, it's corporate. We are the church. We are called as a body. Yet at the same time, there's an individual aspect to it so that when we're in glory, we'll be praising and worshiping the Lord with the multitudes. But also God will be loving us individually. He's able to do that. He's able to receive worship and praise and love and to give love back to the whole body of the redeemed and glory and at the same time to you individually. So picture that moment, if you will. Imagine that for you as an individual. What will it be like? The picture I had in my mind and my imagination at that moment was I was standing on top of a really, really high mountain. And it was just absolutely beautiful. And I never saw the face of Jesus, but it was like he was standing there and I knew it was him. Gentle breeze blowing. I had so much peace and sense of fulfillment. He spoke to my heart and said, all I've ever called you to was to know me and to know my word. He's, what, he, what, what, what that did is it simplified everything for me. What I was praying for in my own life at the time is, what do you want with my life? What am I going to do? What's my calling? What's my vocation? Should I, at the time, I was asking, should I be a pastor again? I had been one for about five years, and I wasn't at the time. And I was troubled as to what, what kind of schooling should I can per, be pursuing. And, and I had all these questions that were burdening me. And there was such a strong sense of the simplicity of Jesus saying, all I've called you to. Felt like I was at the end of the race, the end of my life. I'd now come before Christ. You're saying, it's all so simple. I was just calling you to know me and to know my word. And um, I sometimes in my mind would just go back to that moment and try to remember the simplicity we might get all caught up in, am I witnessing enough for Jesus? Am I doing enough for Jesus? Well, what about your relationship to him? Perhaps sitting at his feet, even as Mary did in the account of Mary and Martha, sitting at his feet and getting to know him and his word. Bring yourself to that simplicity of knowing Christ. Read the Gospels sit in his presence, talk to him, and let him do his work in you, and let the work he does in you bear fruit. There's a simplicity to, our being, to us as being Christians. There's a simplicity to it. And in that simplicity of a focus on the beauty of Jesus Christ and his gospel, we'll find rest we will find rest. The scripture that really supported what I was um, thinking, standing before him and, and knowing Christ and knowing his gospel, we do know that in the gospel of John, which really is, even though it may seem complex when you're reading it, it really is very simple. There's a simplicity about the Gospel of John. Jesus said, you will know the truth. This is in chapter 8. And the truth will set you free. And then in chapter 17, right before his death, in his high priestly prayer, he says this. Chapter 17 of John's Gospel. The first three verses says this. When Jesus had spoken these words... He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all mankind, over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
This is eternal life. This is what it's all about. This is why I've come into the world. That they might know you. Think about that. Jesus comes into the world and goes to the cross and suffers and dies for us that we might know God. Does God want you and does God want me? Does God want all of us to know him? Does God want us to know Christ? That's why he came, that we might know him. The simplicity, the simplicity of the gospel. Yes, there's so much we do need to know about Christ because what he's revealed about himself is important. But he wants us to know him. He wants us to know him. Paul says in chapter 3 of Philippians that I might know Christ and him crucified. I knew nothing to the Corinthians. He said, I knew nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. To know Christ. And in verse 24 of the same chapter, John 17, Jesus saying, Father, I desire. You're, you're getting a look into a desire that Jesus has. Okay? This is cool. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Those whom you have given me, those who have placed their faith in me, I want them to ever be where I am that they might see my glory, the glory that I had with you way back then before the foundation of the world. I want them to see my glory. He wants to share that with us. Once again, the simplicity. Lord, I want to know you. I want to see your glory, and someday I'll, I'll see your glory. There are times when we need to examine Scripture thoroughly. We need to do our studies, our homework, and understand a wholesome theology of Scripture to find strength in that. But I don't think the time of struggle and the time of weariness, the time of extreme brokenness is perhaps not the, that's not the best time to be studying the perplexities of sovereign election and the Trinity and so on and so forth. We need to learn in the midst of warfare, in the midst of the storm, how to settle down to the simplicity of just being at the feet of Jesus, putting our head on his chest perhaps, and just resting in him. The simplicity of the gospel, this is life eternal that they might know you. It's that simple. It's knowing Christ Jesus. In Mark chapter 6, I'm not going to have time to read this. Uh, if you're writing this down, write it down, read it later. Chapter 6, verses 45 to 62, when the disciples have been dismissed by Jesus to cross the lake to go to the other side, right after Jesus had fed the 5,000. And then in the middle of the night, they're struggling at the oars because a storm has arisen. <clears throat> The Bible says Jesus sees them. Now, Jesus is still on the shore. They're out at the lake, and he sees them. I think those words that he sees them are, are, are really interesting. I don't think it's because the moon is shining brightly, because after all, there's a storm going on. And I don't think it's because they're next to the shore, because they wouldn't be terrified then. I think this is sovereign. It's something supernatural. This is because of who Jesus is. He sees them. And, that comforts me because in the midst of the storm, when I'm not seeing him, I can take confidence in the fact that he sees me struggling. They were struggling at the, with the oars. They were struggling. He sees their struggle. He sees our struggle. And what does he do? He goes out to sea and is walking on the water. Well, the initial response there of walking on the waters, they're terrified. It, it, it was felt at that time, believed by some, that if, if, you, 
if you were about to hit disaster, perhaps be killed, you would see spirits. So these guys are in the midst of a horrible storm, and all of a sudden they see somebody walking on the water. They are absolutely terrified, and they cry out and say, it's a ghost. And Jesus said, not to fear. He says, it is I. It's me. In the midst of a storm, in the midst of their terror, Jesus comes walking on the water, and this is not smooth water. This is a storm, but he's not overcome by the storm. He can walk on it in the midst of the storm. And it would have hearkened back, it should have brought to their minds the Old Testament scriptures which show Jehovah God, Yahweh God, walking on the waters. Jesus was revealing something profound to them. He is the Lord and the master of all creation. He's unmoved by the storm. And he comes walking to them, and then he says, don't be afraid. It's, it's I. Actually, he, what he said in the literal Greek is, I am. He simply says, I am. Gets into the boat, everything calms down. Jesus talks about their hardness of heart and inability just to simply trust. But I like the picture that that scripture passage paints of a storm. And they're terrified. And they're struggling. And Jesus simply says, it is I. Well, people, there's a simplicity to our faith. Yes, there's a complexity to life. And yes, things can get very dark. And our hearts can be filled with unbelief and, and, um, and doubts and questions and dismay. We can become discouraged. But to know that there needs to be a place for us. Something we bring to mind about Jesus. Open our Bible and come to a place like Mark chapter 6. Or go to John 17, those first couple of verses. Or go to Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 through 30. And just sit down and focus on the simplicity of this wonderful Savior. He's my Savior. I'm not my Savior. He's my Savior. I don't understand all that's going on in my mind, in my emotions, in my life, in the world, in my past, and in all this baggage I often carry, I, in my sins. I don't understand all that, but he does. And he accepts me and loves me and loved me before the foundation of the world and died on the cross for me, rose from the dead, and I'm in his heart engraven on his hands. In those times of hardship, perhaps in times of persecution and troubles that may be coming to our nation, we as Christians need to know how to rest and find our strength in Jesus Christ. We need to learn how to turn all the voices off <laughs> and quiet our theological speculations and focus on this one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John's Gospel, throughout John's Gospel, and that's a great place to go, and this is where we're going to finish today. In John's Gospel, the very, very beginning, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. Just read those. Simple verses. Jesus came to his own. His own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him. Uh, excuse me, that's verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I believe in him and I have everlasting life. Trust in him, rest in him, for in him I have life. 
In chapter 4 of John's Gospel, the woman at the well. He says, come to me and drink. You'll never thirst again. I can give you living water. When you think about Jesus' confrontation with Nicodemus in chapter 3 and then the woman at the well in chapter 4, it's really very simple. Jesus is talking to these people and saying, trust me. I'll satisfy your thirst. I'll give you new life, Nicodemus, and, and all your struggles to obey Torah and to be the perfect Jewish leader and Pharisee. I'll give you new birth. I'll cause you to be born again. Believe in me. There's a simplicity to it. He simply reaches out to the blind man in chapter 9 and heals him. Gives him sight. And then this blind man goes before the, the Jewish court. He's eventually kicked out of the synagogue for his faith in Jesus. But he's confident as he stands before these, these leaders and says, it's amazing that you don't understand. I, I, I was once blind and now I see. Look at the confidence he had. Where did that confidence come from? The halls of a theological seminary? No. From his encounter with the living Christ. In John 10, verse 11, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. <laughs> I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one talked about it. That's why we read Psalm 23 at the beginning. He'll lead us beside quiet, still waters of rest. He'll make us lie down in green pastures. Yes, there's times when we go through the valley overshadowed by death itself, that dark valley, but he's with me. His rod, his staff will bring me comfort. In the valley of death itself, he, my shepherd, will bring me comfort. There's times when he'll cause me to rest and refresh me. A shepherd would lead his sheep to quiet, still waters so that they would drink. If the waters were rough, they would be terrified and would be afraid to get a drink. Jesus knows how to quiet our souls. Come to me and I will give you rest, you who are weary and heavy laden. In John eleven twenty five, in the face of death itself, when Lazarus was in the grave and Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Does it seem, does your Christianity at times seem complex? Do you think to yourself, am I believing right here? Am I believing right there? Does Satan come against you with doubts about God's love for you and about your own salvation? Then run to Jesus who says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even if he dies, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. It's simple. John the Apostle in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 25, says this is, this is what it's all about. This is his promise to you, even eternal life. This is the promise that he's promised you, eternal life. It's, sometimes it's our flesh, sometimes it's the devil, whatever, our emotions, our struggles, what we're going through, but... The waters can become very muddied and we get confused and we begin to struggle. There's storms in life. It's inevitable that there will be storms. Bring yourself back. Sit down. Quiet yourself. Bring yourself back to the simplicity of the gospel. I believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus I'm just going to look to you, you, the good shepherd who said, I am the resurrection and the life. John concludes his gospel by saying, many other things truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in these books. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you'll have life in his name. How simple is that? It's simple. You have life by believing in his name. These are written that you might believe and that by believing you will have life. 
I realize that the Bible teaches much about that last moment when, when the nations of the world and all people will stand before the throne. There will come a time when we'll stand before Christ for the first time. But I believe there's, a, there's an aspect to it. An aspect of simplicity. Like I had that day at that Bible study at Elmbrook Church all those years ago. Where it's so simple, he just peacefully stood before me. I said, all I ever called you to is to know me, to know my word. Jesus said, come to me and find rest. I will get my yoke. Yeah, there's a yoke. I have a teaching, and your obedience is important. But learn from me. I'm meek and lowly in heart. You'll find rest in me. There was a little baby in that manger. One little tiny baby. And, and then when he was presented at the temple, Simeon said, now my eyes, I can die now, Lord. You can let your servant depart in peace because my eyes have seen your salvation. All of the temple activities are going on behind him, but he's holding a baby and saying, now, Lord, I can die. My eyes have seen your salvation. Who is the hope of all the glory of your people Israel and the hope for all nations and that little child. There's a simplicity to the gospel for each and every one of us. Find a scripture, find something about the character of Jesus and his promises where you know that that's your trysting place, your meeting place, your private inner chamber where you go to sit down and find rest in the simplicity of the person and gospel of Jesus Christ. Find that rest. Jesus wants you to have that rest, that kind of trust, and that kind of confidence. How many times do we hear throughout Scripture, fear not? Well, we need to conclude this. I hope, I hope that that was a blessing to you. There's a simplicity even in the communion service that we have as we receive that communion. How simple, the bread and the juice, but in it we're reminded of eternal life because of the shed blood and the broken body 